Welcome to the Film of Steins, the Double Feature Podcast. Join us as we unravel the interwoven experience of the continuous conversation of cinema. Take part in pairing movies with their curse counterparts, movies that share DNA, or even pairing questionable duos by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash filmasteins. We offer tiers at the $1, $5, and $20 level, where the $5 tier grant the ability to request films to further the discussion. So grab some popcorn and sit back and get ready to join the 100-year conversation. This is the Film of Steins, where movies are more than just entertainment there and experience there and experience all around near you and welcome back to another episode of the film of steins thank you guys for joining us today today i'm joined by my ape friend lucy hello everyone Remember, we post every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with brand new episodes of the film of steins some recent episodes include the revenant challengers king richard memories of murder and Bong Joon-ho's other film, Mother, not to be confused with Mother, Darren Aronofsky's film. <laughs> <laughs> Remember to leave nice comments, thoughts, and ideas as well on our Patreon at patreon.com slash filmasteins. Come request a movie. Come subscribe. Four dollar, five dollars. We appreciate all the support. Thank you guys very much. Are you stressed and filled with anxiety like I am? Maybe in a bit of pain from that car accident you had a few years ago? Well... The sponsor of today's episode, Hempville CBD, has us covered. They have the highest quality products created by chemists and doctors. Hempville carries everything from CBD to THC dispensary grade without those despicable dispensary prices. Order your Delta 8, 9, edibles, and vapes along with the THCA flower and get free shipping when you spend $50 or more at HempvilleCBD.com. Check out the link in the description for more details. But today we should have an interesting discussion. We're talking about West Balls. 2024 kickoff of a new trilogy i believe kingdom of the planet of the apes i just wanted to put it out there i hate the title of all four of these films rise of dawn of war of it's just i know from the beginning we kind of set up planet of the apes how do you add to that how do you colonize it how do you sequelize it i get it it's already a clause but rise of the of the it's just it's too much i hate it i've always hated it and kingdom just took it too far for me that's interesting i've always liked the titles i like how long they are we're just missing a subject we need a (laughs) we got a whole sentence (laughs) that's fine with me i was very excited to see this film i'm actually a mild fan of the recent trilogy with andrew sakis who played caesar of course who's famously been rejected the Oscar nom. I don't know why that's so controversial, but... For Caesar? Yeah. I mean, I guess he sh- probably should have been nominated. It was great. Great, great performance. Yeah. I don't really know what he was up against, but it's that's a thing that pops up, you see. I'm actually a big fan of the original Planet of the Apes. I haven't seen many of the other older ones. I've seen, of course, the Tim Burton, the terrible Tim Burton one. That's why Tim Burton's name starts with a T, because terrible Tim Burton. Starting off strong. That movie's embarrassing. Mark Wahlberg, you know, that movie kind of sucks. Is that the one I saw? I believe so, yeah. Okay. That's my only experience. The brief. That's the oldest Planet of the Apes you know of. Yeah. We should watch the original. It's actually really good. All right, if you say so. I don't know. I don't know about that. It was one of the first old movies that I saw that was actually good. I was like, oh man, old movies can be good. (laughs) Like I said, I was very excited for this film. I was curious where we were going to take things because outside of like the Marvels and maybe I guess Star Wars, we don't see a lot of like trilogies continuing. Right. And I was curious if we were just going to kind of get a, not a retelling, but just a kind of reboot. Like it, okay, takes place in the same universe. Yeah, but it's so far removed that Everything that happened in the previous trilogy is completely irrelevant. I was happy to see that that wasn't the case. That we've actually idealized, mythologicalized Caesar and some of his iconography. You gotta love the window that Raka rocks. And I will say, I think I like this better than the first of the recent trilogy, Rise. Or at least as much. I think we're on a good path. I don't 
you know, I think these films are all very good. I think they're actually much better than the contemporaries around are, you know, the Fantastic Beasts, the the Marvels and Star Wars and like these Avatar, these kind of bigger things that, you know, are supposed to draw a lot of eyes, Transformers, I guess. A lot of these properties kind of like not necessarily suck, but they're just like very modern Hollywood. But the eight movies seem to be a little more adulty and thoughtful, at least thoughtfully made. And I dare say have some of the best CG on the market. And I was very pleasantly surprised that this movie is just good. I was, wow, I was very sold. Very happy to see it. Very happy to move forward with what the Planet of the Apes world has to offer. But you are probably the biggest Planet of the Apes, at least the recent trilogy. You're probably the biggest fan I know of for these films. You're actually the only person that seems to recognize that these films are just far superior than the the Star Wars and its contemporaries. Fantastic Beasts, I think, is a really great analog. So how do you feel about Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes? <laughs> I liked it. Probably my least favorite of this new series we have going on here. And I'm such a fan of the first three, especially the first one. I mean, the first one is definitely my favorite. Wow, okay. And I know that's not what everyone agrees with. I think it goes in the other direction. Rise, then dawn, then war for a lot of people, I think. For me, at least. Yeah, I think so too, from what I could tell. But I, I think the first one is just phenomenal. It's one of the greatest things I've seen. I mean, I saw it. I bought it. I have it. And I couldn't wait for the next ones. Like, it's one of the few series that I couldn't wait for the next movie. Like, some movies, they're like, oh, yeah, that's that's cool. They're going to have a next one. Can't wait for it to come out. But these other ones are like, okay, no, I know when it's coming. I have the date written down. I am going to go see it, and I am going to go buy it. Like, that's how much I love these movies. They're amazing. Then This one was good, but it just wasn't on par with the other ones. It's hard to compete with Caesar. It's hard to compete with Caesar, and and I thought we were going to have some sort of, like, Caesar lineage continuation going on here. Maybe not his son, but his son's son's son's, like, you know, someone related to Caesar here. But we didn't, and we have a new character, Noah, and is he as likable as Caesar? I don't know yet. With this film, he's not. So... That kind of took it down for me. Like, Caesar is just so loved in all the other movies that I don't have that love with that main character that I like about these movies. I feel you. But okay, I'm glad we got something new. I'm glad we kind of went in very deep into the future. I don't know, what is it, like 200, 300 years that we went in or something like that? So it's something new. We didn't try to go something more traditional, which, okay, I appreciate that. I like that, like how you said, I like that we have this world where we get to see Caesar's teachings and Caesar's belief system implemented in this new world. Because Caesar is, he is the start of it all with the Samian flu, pretty much with the outbreak, I guess. So it's just really cool to see like the aftermath of something like that, the aftermath of those consequences. And also, like, mankind's de-evolution, sort of. I don't know. There's still something there. We didn't expand on it a lot. We have this girl named May. I don't like her. I don't know what we're going to do with her. We have also other humans that are very devolved. How did that split happen? Like, are we just having two new human species? Like, what are we? Like, Homo sapiens sapiens? Two? Like, I don't know. Like, how how much did we devolve and split? Like, what is going on? I'm, I'm curious for that. Hopefully we get some answers there. The movie looked beautiful. The apes were cool. Are they as beloved? I don't know. We have a new orangutan, which I know he's one of the beloved characters in the first three films, Maurice. And now we have Raka. And I'm hearing that that's everyone's favorite character right now. 
which is cool, but I don't know. I don't think we got enough of him. We just didn't have enough of the story. Even though the story is fun, we had a little bit of a slow buildup that I didn't quite like, but I, I understand. Okay, we got to set this world up. Okay, it's brand new, really. The score was good. The cinematography was beautiful. The CG looked awesome. A little too awesome, maybe a little too creepy. But this franchise has always had really awesome CG, in my opinion, that it's just like maybe not even the point to talk about the CG. Was it good? Was it bad? Because it, it was awesome. So I don't know. I'm very disappointed if I'm putting all my love from the first three movies into it. But if I can separate it from it, it's a good movie. And I'm excited to see where they're going to take things. Yeah, the glaring difference between the trilogy and this new one is the sacrifice of intimacy and character for a bigger world, world building and potentially culture and like literal future of yeah where things are headed. It's a big sacrifice because it starts to make some of these characters feel a little meaningless and small. While at the same time we get Noah going through this little bit of a coming of age story taking up the mantle. I wasn't quite clear on if his dad was like the leader of their clan or if he was just the keeper of the birds. I didn't know what the hierarchy was there. Sort of irrelevant though. It doesn't matter. Some of the visuals in this film are insane though. Yeah. The reclaimed skyscrapers and cities and yes, it's some of the coolest stuff ever made on in movies for sure. Yes. I wasn't able to place where we were in the movie, like when we were watching it, because we went to the movie theater to see this. I couldn't quite place what city we were in until after, you know, doing my research. They're in Los Angeles because I think someone said the airport looked like the LAX airport and just some other like buildings and stuff. They're like, it looks just like this. So we were in LA, which is cool. I like that. I like that we can't tell. Unless you do some digging. It wasn't like the Statue of Liberty somewhere mm-hmm. in the back, you know? Yeah, people who are familiar with that. I guess it was probably the place where Rocket and Noah were walking about. They probably noticed some something there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had no idea where we were at. I um, was wondering if they're going to name drop it at the very end there. Because they were like, where are you guys? That were in Indiana. And then it's like, uh, yeah. oh, we're in LA. And it's like, they didn't do that. I'm too stupid to know. <laughs> I can't look at one of those photos, like a geolocation game that you can play that gives you just a photo and you can identify. You know, some people are very good at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm with you. We we sacrifice some of the performative elements that make the trilogy so strong. We sacrifice, especially coming off of war, where it's very performative and biblical. It ends with this Moses-esque march out of the prison into a land of paradise. Yep. Caesar dies. Yep. That's how the movie starts. Very cool. I don't know if that's very cool. I don't know how I felt about that. What ties in the most important theme of the of this new film in that the stories and kind of ideologies morph and mutate and distort over time, which I liked coming from Raqqa because it almost felt like a little bit of a jab at all religions. Across time. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I was like, that's, that's hilarious. kind of a ballsy thing to place like that. Yeah. And how people can obviously take advantage of it and cherry pick what they want out of it. And it just felt like all of a sudden every denomination of every thought was kind of put on blast for a split second. Mostly irrelevant to the greater picture, but I was like, that's actually really kind of clever. I did like that that's how we started the movie. I didn't like that we made it a little too fast to let you settle in. For all those fans, like, I wanted to cry in that moment remembering that Caesar was gone. And I didn't have that time. But then the story continued and then it was so slow that I know you could have sacrificed that time to give me that closure I needed from Caesar. But 
again, not his movie, so maybe, maybe not. Yeah, you can imagine in like a TV show, there would have been a whole first episode dedicated to wrapping that up, and then there would have been this surprise jump forward several hundred years. Yes, yeah. Which I could have seen working really well here, but it would have pushed us over the three-hour mark, and that's scary business for companies theaters i don't i'm not sure why there's probably all kinds of data supporting that three-hour movies are very risky my main problem with this film is may she's extremely weak and we even have this huge cringe moment where she's like in this prairie of reeds or whatever and tall grass and she's running from the kingdom of apes to noah and raka and she has this Caesar moment of shouting out to Noah. I was like, oh man, we're putting... Like, I love the idea of kind of morphing the story back onto humans and them kind of reclaiming Earth because that's going to be a very cool, full circle piece of storytelling that I hope comes to fruition. But having that silence to yelling moment coming from May, a very weak, performative presence, it's... Super underwhelming. I was severely underwhelmed by that. Yeah, I completely agree. It gave me vibes from that movie, A Good Dinosaur, and that little human dude. I don't know his name. Spot, I think that's his name. <laughs> I don't remember. And, like, you know, the main story is being told through the dinosaur's perspective, and here we have it being told through apes, and then the human is the Neanderthal who doesn't know anything. Like, that's the vibe it gave me. That's funny. I didn't think about that. that make, yeah, that makes sense. That checks out. And I just, I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like anything about her. And if I'm supposed to be rooting or be hopeful for the franchise to have humans make a comeback, May was the wrong character to get me to hope for that. I completely agree. But it's kind of funny because of where we landed when she hooked back up with her hidden community of functioning people, it gave the impression that she was just one of many and was just kind of a pawn on a mission to get this job done. So it just kind of reinforced this point of, man, none of these characters matter. Yes. They're completely inconsequential as far as just completing a mission. And that's my kind of confusion on this movie and where it, really starts to falter it's super strong in the world it's built and kind of the mission and the, the the factions of different apes and this kind of mongolian style proximus caesar collecting all the apes in the area to form a kingdom it's really kind of amazing and we get some really cool things from proximus caesar of course and i swear when he got up on like that scaffolding when he was introduced and yeah he was yeah, yeah. talking to the apes i swear he's gonna say can you dig it from the warriors it just felt <laughs> like that was coming i don't know if that's was an intentional nod or not but and it's such a relevant thing because part of the mission or the statement of this new franchise i think is going to be that together apes and humans are strong you know we have a lot of that in the first series apes together are strong and now raka kind of made it seem like everyone together is strong Let's learn from Caesar and make it better. But we didn't get the human aspect we needed to make it like, yes, together we can be strong like that. You see what I'm saying? Totally. And it's really a nice through line. If we, and if we can pull it off, it can be probably really beautiful storytelling because, you know, humans invent the smart ape. We then have this desperation out of humans and dawn of Planet of the Apes and desperation out of the apes to try just try to not kill each other internally and between humans and apes yep. and then we just have this kind of further desperation of the last you know semblance of humanity trying to hold on but on the other side of that there is that question of why can't we just get along coexist not just between apes and humans between human and human you know like we don't see in war but that's sort of a central theme in this movie is the coexisting and goes as far as forcing a coexistence with other apes of different factions of apes 
through our kingdom and Proxima Caesar. And of course, Raka being very scientifically minded and seeing that there is clear possibility of us coexisting because we once did in some capacity. He doesn't really know exactly how, which I love that everything is completely skewed and Mm -hmm. distorted over time. And they are even preserving books that they can't read and they just have these artifacts that's that they think is theirs or think have something to do with apes. I think that's very well said because you helped answer two of the questions I had, which I don't know if they were important questions or not, but maybe, which was why did they call the humans echoes? And I like that you said that like the last semblance of humanity and trying to hold on to that. Because I couldn't quite place on giving them the term echoes, especially coming from the apes themselves, is weird. But okay, that, that, that helps answer that. And then why the zebras? Out of all the animals, why did we sprinkle in a few zebras here and there to coexist with everybody? Because what do you take away from dream scenario? The zebras are strongest together. Zebras are strongest together. They are that middle point between apes and humans. There you go. Pretty smart. Yeah, it's... Pretty smart. It's. I mean, it's a surprising movie, actually. I'm, I'm mostly impressed. I just, I hate that these little things, like the performance of May was just kind of bad. May is not a little thing, though. You know, it's... Yes, yeah. May is not a little part. And she has this real performative moment that just is super flat. And then her being very savage and killing one of her own, you know, like that's one of Caesar's biggest rules. Ape doesn't kill ape. And I imagine he's, you know, a very smart guy. Also, human doesn't kill human. And here she is being so savage. So again, I don't understand. Am I supposed to be rooting for humanity again? Or is it just not that kind of movie that we're headed? We were missing that kind of monological piece coming from a may like character in maybe a couple in displaying her ideology and why it might even be okay in certain scenarios for that kind of violence for certain guaranteed change which is hard to guarantee of course because she's quick to pull out that gun too yeah And we get that real deceptive thing at the end where she's got the gun behind her back. Very theatrical and over the top. Good close up on it. Mm -hmm. You know, where we see Noah in the back. It's great. If it was anyone else. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's great storytelling, but we just get a weak mouthpiece. Because we also have another human in this film. Is it Trevithan? Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. Frank. Frank Gallagher. And he also has something to say about being with these apes and for her just to let it go and accept where we are right now. But then he dies quickly. So, uh, again, why are we introducing these characters? But but I don't know. That See, that's where I'm just a little bit confused. Maybe I need that second movie to completely tie it in and this movie was just solely made to build the world. Kind of like Dune 1. Where you're like, what? What's going on? What? Uh, huh? Sure, yeah. Beautiful world, by the way. But what's going on? Yeah, the inclusion of William Macy's character was a bit strange. I mean, I like that Proximus Caesar had this smart human basically held captive to teach them things, design, invent. Also providing that there is clear reason and And even an example of apes and humans coexisting. But I don't know exactly how to take William Macy's character's defeatist attitude of this is just how things are now when you're that thoughtful. I mean, I guess if you're very confident that most of the humanity is wiped out and the few select are immune to the simian flu or whatever, there's something maybe deterministic and nihilistic there, but... Like we've said in the past, nihilistic characters are never very interesting on camera or in real life. (laughs) (laughs) But I was surprised to see Frank Gallagher making it out of Chicago, you know? (laughs) 
I think that's one thing I like about this series too, because the first series you have James Franco and Tom Felton, and you're like, what? What's Draco doing here? So I I like that. And then the third movie, what's his name? Woody Harrelson. You're like, what are what are you doing here? So it's just these like interesting actors coming into these films. I I, I like it. Yeah, no Chris Pratt's or. Mark Wahlberg's. Yeah. He seemed like he'd be in here somewhere. He was in the Tim Burton one. Oh, they didn't invite him back. They were like, no. (laughs) Also, were you confused when she said that she was going to find a book? That she needed to like rescue a book? That this book was like super important, but it wasn't a book? Am I making too much of that? It's almost like she was dumbing it down for the apes. Okay. They'll, they'll know what a book is, you know, kind of thing. And they do, or at least Rocket does. She knows that a hard drive style thing serves the same purpose as a book and books are a plenty. Yeah, but Noah's not dumb. And Rocco wasn't there when she said the thing about the book. Okay. She said it to Noah and his two friends. Yeah, when they were in the vault when or, they were in the, or yeah. about to go that way. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I was like, huh, what book is she about to pull out here? And it was just that satellite key or whatever, whatever that thing is called. That just threw me off. Probably not important, you know, maybe just a character defining moment of what she thinks about these dumb apes. I mean, it made me think that it might be some kind of Bible oriented thing. Not necessarily the Bible, but something. Maybe written around Caesar's time. Like, I don't know. Some kind of piece of guidance in one way or another, especially because Caesar coming off of War of the Planet of the Apes is the predecessor to Jesus. He's Moses writing his Ten Commandments. Yep. Writing his... He's really only got three, right? <laughs> so three or four. Yes, I, I completely agree with you. I thought it was something... Which could still come together in a religious way, but it was really just the mission of... And she was all deceptive about it, just trying to get to point A to B to C. Didn't want to befriend the apes. She was... A complete non-character, really. She yeah. was. I hope she's not in the sequels, really. I hope we just have a real human character coming forward. I think Noah and his friends, especially together, can kind of come into their own and have some personality, have some meaningful pizzazz. I, but I don't know what they're going to really bring to the world and mission of Planet of the Apes. Though. They're just these random guys in a random tribe that we're at the right place at the right time to meet up with this human to serve her needs. Yeah, that's true. I'm very curious to see where they'll take it. I mean, they control eagles, so that's awesome. Is that an American nod? I don't know. (laughs) They weren't bald eagles. Is it a Mexican nod? I think they were... I don't know. I think they were like brown-looking eagles. I know you briefly mentioned Proximus. He's a very cool character. I wish we would have gotten more of him. We did not get enough of him. And I don't know if it's just me, but I got Koba vibes from him. And that would be interesting if maybe this was the lineage I was looking for from the other movies. This being like Koba's kid or whatever. Because he was a little too concerned about apes being put back in cages. And he got a little too excited when he found out there were guns. Yeah, that's funny. I I think it's mostly coincidental. Maybe supposed to kind of bring some familiarity in it. No lineage, I don't think. Because, you know, he has William Macy there to tell him, you know, you guys were... The true. You know, shit-throwing entertainment when we were in charge. Some countries ate you, you know? (laughs) One thing I think that's very cool about the name, which I know was always a wonder in the older films being connected to the recent trilogy. And it seems to be kind of tangentially confirmed that Caesar is now just a word for king in a way. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh. But we do have this literal kind of representation of the fall of Caesar and his hunger for power and territory and control was the death of him. And I will say, as corny as it kind of is, 
final boss battles are always kind of corny and whatever. But if you're even slightly invested, there are a lot of times emotional. I did think it was awesome. The eagles coming in to help and yes, yes, that whole <laughs> take part care was of this awesome. Guy. Yes, that was cool. Yeah, th- the whole end was cool. Even with May in it, even the betrayal and stuff, and her killing another human and blowing shit up, like all that was cool. The end was cool. But why did I think that Noah was about to put some of these apes on a boat? Maybe some of these zebras. I don't know. I I was getting that vibe, that feeling for where the location we were at in his game. Yes, especially coming off of Caesar being this Messiah feeling figure, writing his commandments. We had this biblical thing in the back of our mind, no doubt. And I can tell you why there was a lot of water here, the same effects team who worked on. And I can tell you why there's a lot of water here, the same effects team who that worked on avatar way of the water was involved in this they were flexing so they're flexing Ah, they're flexing you know avatar and the apes movies are king of cg there's no doubt about it these are much better films than the two avatar films Agreed. and i'm sure they don't want to get too close to the sun in that way they don't want to have just kind of biblical retellings through the (laughs) enablings you know yeah 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 but if you're if you're going to go ahead and be cute about stuff, putting them on a little boat would have been <laughs> funny. You know, you're already being fucking adorable with the window symbol. That was dope. That, that was, was probably awesome. my favorite part of the movie. Yes, that was awesome. Yeah. Very, very nice nod. You have the nod of calling all the humans Novas. Mm-hmm. Also awesome. So, you know, I'm not mad at this film. I will say in War of the Planet of the Apes, I never really liked the fact, I think Maurice named the little girl Nova because of the sigil or logo from from the car. Yeah. I never really liked that. I was like, ah, man, they just, I don't know how else you're going to do it, but it felt kind of forced and lame. Yeah. Trying to connect it to the originals. Oh, to the, oh, oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. The girl's name in the original is Nova. Oh. So... That was another question, like, why are these two girls named Nova when they're thousands of years apart? It's because they call all humans Novas, just like they call all apes with power Caesar. They should have gone, like, the supernova route or something in the sky, not the car. But, all right, I don't know how that would have come up. Well, something, I mean, they look at the stars a few times. That was fun. The telescopes, the radio telescopes at the end to communicate, very fun, very kind of outward looking in space. I mean in war. That's where the name originated, right? I don't think we have space elements in war, but we might. I don't know, but I I like the nod here, and I guess it's an even further nod. Who knows? Who knows how they're going to tie everything up? I don't think I have a favorite moment, a favorite scene which is sad because I I at least find something that just made me crack up or just really connected with me or made me cry or whatever. I don't have a favorite character. I want to like Raka, but he just wasn't in there enough. I did like his kind of nod to Maurice and this preservation of knowledge. I really like that, but not enough to get him to be my favorite character. Noah was just, you know, coming of age story a boy i couldn't connect with him couldn't connect with the humans so some of my favorite things to pick from movies were lacking yeah i mean i completely agree there was such little character across the board that i mean you had no choice but to probably pick proximus caesar just because of his performative thing that's true and noah feels to be honest like a silent protagonist in a game like he's you're just he's the vessel for everything to come And we get a little bit of this coming of age, him stepping in his dad's shoes, represented mostly through the eagle. It's fine. It's cute. The boss battle at the end kind of sells it, I think. It's nothing to really look forward to. Yeah. But they did set up a world in such a way that they have a lot to work for and work up to. And at some point, you're going to have to have some character involved. 
Baraka's coming back. I'm telling you right now that he'll be back. They're just trying to tease. Yeah, he's going to have one of those moments. But that's very well put, him kind of just being this audience surrogate character that we don't really interact with. We just are. And yeah, you have no choice but to pick Proximus. Because I did like, now that you say that, I did like when they were pulling, trying to get the gate open. They're like, you know, apes strong together. Like, yeah, everyone's hyped. They're pulling. It's shit's happening. And then shit's not happening and they don't get it. And then he said, maybe apes will be stronger tomorrow. I'm like, oh my God, that's hilarious. But that, that, that's it. That was, that was the only funny bit. Yeah. And there's almost this element of Proxima Caesar's not bad. He's very, he's a visionary, of course. He's not a runaway dictator quite yet. He's just a little bit of a colonizer and forcing trade and camaraderie and relationships. He's just not afraid to use violence, which, you know, sucks when you're on the other side of it, when you're being <laughs> dealt violence. <laughs> See, this is where this is where I just get Koba vibes because Koba's not bad. He just Koba, didn't trust humans, right? He just didn't trust humans and especially Jacobs, who tortured the shit out of him i mean he got experimented on you know watch guardians of the galaxy 3 like just think that and then get into the mindset of koba so koba got some guns he got some friends caesar you're being too nice i mean is he a bad guy i mean yeah you're right it's really just another reason why these three films are very good yeah talk about adding complexity to your characters you can't hate koba you hate him when he kills caesar yeah okay but if there weren't these little details and you know kind of internal conflicts between certain characters and ideologies people would probably be a little more mad about dawn and war being very similar films that's a good point but they're not they are but they're not you know yep all right man well i'm very I was very happy to watch that film with you. Thank you for watching that with me and talking about it here today. You're welcome. Do you have a budget guess for this very expensive looking movie? I'm thinking a hundred million. It's pretty long. I'm not sure what's CG and what's filmed what because I thought I read somewhere that it was filmed on location, but I don't know what that means here in this movie like did you go out in the forest like i don't i don't know i don't know what filmed on location means here that's a good question <laughs> and then we have a different director so I, I i just wasn't sure how high to go but i know for a fact it's a hundred or more yeah it's it's obvious when you see a movie like this that's got this kind of run time and of course west ball is famous for the maze runner series of films I think that's also a trilogy. Which I've heard are underrated. I like them. I've never seen them, I believe, but I know it's got eyebrows in it. Yeah, it's got eyebrows, dude, but I, I like them. I, surprisingly, that was one of the few series that I watched the movie before I read the books. And then when I read the books, I was a little bit too old to be reading those kinds of books. So they didn't quite hit like some of the other things I've done that with, but... They're, they're a good series. Well, it says here that it was $160 million. Ooh. So an extremely expensive movie. Hopefully it can make its money back. I it's, hope so. It's gone on to make about $140 million. That's just the first weekend. Okay. I don't think that's bad. I think that's probably on track to do pretty nice. Yes. It's probably going to land around that $650 million if everything goes according to plan. I mean, when we went to go see it, the theater was pretty packed. Yeah, compared to Challengers. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, yeah. We were the only two, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I I don't know if you had people sitting next to you, but on my side, I had this family, I guess, maybe like four or five adults, and this little girl, she looked maybe like she was five around that age, maybe kindergarten age, I don't know. She was being... A little distracting, not going to lie. Yeah, this, like we've kind of been saying, tangentially at least, 
it's not a very kiddy movie. Mm-hmm. It's also very slow compared to the other three. Yes. She kept like sitting. I think it was her dad, I'm assuming. And he was the one sitting next to me. And she kept sitting on his lap for like five seconds and then go into her mom's lap for like five seconds and then walking. And then, you know, she was quiet, but she was just moving around a lot. And I was just like, can you just sit down? I'm yeah. No, I'm trying to focus right now, the little kid. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> and she went to the bathroom like five times with her mom. It's like, man, it sucks for the adults. It's like that, what we were assuming, dad and son that went to go see Godzilla mm, minus one. Yes. That was funny. That was funny. And I think they just left, right? Yeah, was... I think he was scared. Yeah. The yeah. boy was scared. He's probably like seven or eight. Man, I I I would be so mad like if my kid did that. Like, just shut up. Like, especially leaving, a movie like that. Yeah, I'm leaving you at home. That wasn't in theaters very long. Well, over on Letterbox with 119,000 people, not very many yet. That's a good number, really. They weighed in at a 3.5, right in line with the other three. So that's quite the praise, I think. Yes, yes, completely agree. I'm leaning towards a 3, 3.5. I'd probably give my favorite one a 4, maybe 4.5. I don't know. It's so good. I'm probably 4.5, really. But it was the weaker one of the 4. So maybe closer to 3 for me. I'm still thinking about it. Yeah, I'm probably somewhere on a 2.5, which is pretty comfortable. War of the Planet of the Apes kind of goes back and forth in my head between a 2.5 and a 3. They don't speak to me enough to like break that three barrier. I don't see why. <laughs> They're so good. But there's a clear divide between like this one and, and war. So I don't know. These they're uh, they're all all four of them are very good. The original's very good too. The original's probably my favorite. So I it's I don't know, it's hard to place them. I guess I have to see the original and see what you're talking about, and hopefully they speak to me as much as these do. They're different. They, I don't know. They're very different. Okay. There's more of a sense of dread in the original, I think. It's kind of a sadder film. But yeah, man, thanks again. And thank you guys for listening to this episode of The Filmistines. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Remember, we post every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on patreon.com slash filmistines. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, YouTube. Remember to leave nice comments, thoughts, and ideas on our Patreon as well. Come request a movie. Nacho Libre, Spongebob the movie, the original. I'm not watching the others. But yeah, thank you guys for all the support. And until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for today's episode of The Film of Steins. Thanks for tuning in and joining us on our cinematic journey. We hope you enjoyed the discussion and gained some new insights and perspectives in the world of movies. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, especially Patreon at patreon.com slash and follow us on social media for more film-related content. We love hearing from our listeners, so if you have any feedback, suggestions, movie recommendations, or book recommendations, please feel free to reach out to us. Until next time, keep watching and keep loving the magic of movies. This is The Film of Steins, signing off. Oh. <laughs>